Welcome to today's program, Anatomy of an M&A Transaction, How to Issue Spot for Non-Compete, Trade Secrets, Confidential Information, and Intellectual Capital Concerns. All participants are in listen-only mode. You are encouraged to submit questions throughout the program through the Q&A box located on the right side of your window. For those interested in CLE credit, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation. Please write this code down. It will not be repeated and is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording, presentation materials, and CLE verification form will be distributed to attendees in the days following the webinar. At this time, I'd like to turn the program over to Robert Milligan. Thank you, Colleen, and thank you to the audience for joining us for today's uh, one-hour uh, presentation. Um, we want to jump, uh, quickly jump into the material because we have a lot to uh, cover. But just by way of background, um, I work routinely with uh, uh, Susie Saxman, and we thought that you know this particular topic was timely. Um, and there's been some new developments that we think could make it even more uh, timely. Uh, you know, as part of uh, buy-sell transactions, oftentimes trade secret and non-compete issues uh, come up. Um, and they could be those type of issues can be very significant to the underlying underlying business deal. Um, but we also wanted to focus on uh, the confidentiality protections that go into the underlying uh, M&A transaction. Uh, the recent development that I alluded to is that increased government scrutiny of restrictive covenants and non-compete um, agreements in uh, mergers and acquisitions. So we're going to uh, touch on that as well. Uh, by way of uh, table setting and providing the agenda, we hope to uh, capture uh, four uh, key items in today's uh, discussion on the anatomy of an M&A deal. Uh, first, we'll, talk, we'll start with a, a, a basic discussion about um, who's going to be involved in the process. Are you bringing the right team to the deal? Are you bringing the right advisors to the deal? And understanding some of the key issues that, go, that go into um, the target intellectual and workforce uh, capital. Uh, the next component that we're going to discuss is uh, how to effectively conduct uh, due diligence and information sharing while advancing the deal. Now, this is going to have a, a, a focus on confidentiality and trade secret restrictive covenant concerns. It's not over-encompassing as far as the deal as a whole, but really focusing on those key issues about confidentiality, trade secrets, and restrictive covenants. Um, and then we'll talk about some best practices uh, as far as how it um, how, how companies can ensure confidentiality and trade secret protection throughout the deal from both the buyer and the seller's uh, protect, um, perspective. And then we're going to talk about the restrictive covenant, not only in the um, the main uh, deal document, um, but also in some of the ancillary uh, tertiary documents that have to do with uh, key employees and contractors and uh, perhaps even uh, other business partners that may have a stake in the deal. And we'll talk about sort of the lay of the law, uh, the lay of the land there, some key issues that have come up in the, the case law and uh, statutes. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to my uh, co-panelist, uh, Susie Saxman. Uh, Susie's based out of our um, Chicago office, and she is the co-chair of our mergers and acquisitions uh, practice. Uh, she's a longtime uh, CIFAR partner and is very experienced in uh, doing uh, business deals. And like I said, I've collaborated with her on restrictive covenant and trade secret issues in the past as it relates to uh, M&A. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn um, the, 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 the presentation over to Susie to get into our uh, first topic. Great. Thanks a lot, Robert. Um, Colleen, you can go to the next slide. So as Robert said, we're going to do this jointly. We'll have a little bit of back and forth. Um, my practice area is principally M&A, you know, other types of corporate planning and commercial contracts, transactions, um, things of that nature. But as many of you probably listening to this webinar know, the M&A market has been literally on fire this year. Um, the amount of deals, and this is not unique to me, it's not unique to Cyfarth, um, or the towns that we're in. I mean, this is really across the country. Um, there's just been a huge amount of activity, lots of money at private equity, lots of money on the balance sheet. And what we're seeing increasingly is it is easier for uh, a buyer to buy a business to acquire employees, 
an IP than it is to build it from the ground or to hire um, directly. So we're seeing M&A as a tool simply to increase your footprint, even if you're already in that business from a uh, strategic point of view. The things that I'm going to talk about, um, you know, some of these things are not going to be rocket science. I really want to talk about the practical process management of an M&A transaction. And some of these things you're going to say, hey, I already know that. And maybe there are one or two things that you thought, hey, I never really thought of it that way. But it is really critical that everybody on your team, you know, not the least of which is your, your you know, legal counsel, if that's you, or your outside legal counsel, are just acutely aware of where the pitfalls are. Because for a lot of our clients or our companies, they may do one deal. They're one and done. That's it. That's all that happens. Or maybe they do one every five or ten years. I've originated or closed 23 M&A transactions in the 2021 calendar year, so I'd like to think maybe I've you know, learned a little bit about um, some of the process management that's helpful. We see this on a repeat basis. So really right up front, I mean, look, who's going to be on your team? And because time is not your friend when it comes to a deal or a deal process, making sure that people are available, that you know who the team is, that you've got an ability to do damage control if somebody's tied up on something else, unavailable, um, not the right person for a variety of other reasons. Maybe they've got competition from other um, business assignments. And, and really think, um, I've increasingly started to see, um, you know, look, most companies are going to have NDAs in place or at least um, a confidentiality policy in the employee handbook that the internal employees will have signed and they're thinking, great, I've already got it, I'm fine, everything's good. I have increasingly seen uh, target companies establish a separate standalone confidentiality with their internal deal team. And I see it having two purposes. Sometimes you go beyond mere confidentiality and you cover things that are retention oriented, bonus oriented, uh, but sometimes you basically say to people, not only is this confidential, but on this deal, these are the only four people you can talk to. You can't talk to your coworkers. And if you want to escalate an issue, you've got to escalate it to A or B or C. So you're really trying to drive behavior, and that may be one of the reasons that you'll have a deal-specific NDA that you put in place even with your own team. Um, often, you're picking a deal name, and people joke about that all the time. Oh, my God, you work on these crazy deal names. They're all over the board. Half, you know, Maybe three-quarters of the time the investment bankers choose the name, and they assign it to you, and it's, it's sort of a little comical. But let me tell you the value of the deal name. We pretty much start stop using the target's name. We try to veer away from using the target company's name in emails because as an added measure of confidentiality, the less often we're actually tying a company name to M&A activity, the easier it is to maintain confidentiality if there's any sort of an intrusion or an inadvertent, somebody gets copied, somebody sees your email, uh, somebody's got you know proxy over your email box when you're out of the office, that kind of thing. So uh, that's something that's helpful. Communication channels and documents. Where are you going to store your documents and how are you going to communicate? Now, I don't know about you, but my firm basically says you use your CIFARS email, period, end of discussion, because we have a secure network, nothing else. I have plenty of clients who say to me, oh my God, do not send me email at my work address. People can see it, somebody monitors it, I have an assistant. Um, you know, there are all sorts of reasons, or I don't have a secure place I can store things. So I'm not going to give you all the answers to, you know, what you do as a workaround. Just address the issue so everybody understands, and then understand if you do have confidential information sitting on some of your employees' Gmail accounts that you don't have any access to, that you understand what the end game is to either control, capture, or delete those. So another thing to think about. And then all your other internal systems around confidentiality, um, you know, how are you really going to do things? How are you going to communicate with people out of town, people in different time zones? I mean really different time zones. I don't mean California. I mean India, um, you know, uh, 
Shanghai, Hong Kong, you know, Europe, other places, you know, are there things that are really obvious that you're going to have to create some communication channels? Maybe we always want to have our all hands meeting at 7 a.m. in the morning on uh, uh, in Chicago because I know that's a pretty good time in a lot of other time zones. So think about those sorts of things. Next slide. So putting your NDAs in place and then looking at the information that you're going to get pulled together right at the very beginning of a transaction. Normally what the target company will do right at the very outset, outset is prepare what's, what's universally called a teaser. It is almost always a three to five page document that does not have any names. It's got enough information to be attractive and to be accurate, but it's not enough in theory to identify the target. Uh, if you're working with an investment banker, usually they're going to help you prepare the teaser. Um, I certainly prepared plenty of these sorts of things because sometimes what we're doing from the law firm point of view is we're working with a client to first interview and then engage an investment banker. So uh, put enough in there so an investment banker can tell, is this in my sweet spot? Is it you know, my end of the market? Does it seem like it's a good fit? Um, I'd like to be able to send that. Maybe you'll send it to you know, three, four, five different investment banking firms. Uh, with a no name, you'll ask them to sign an NDA and send it back. My personal experience is that M&A investment bankers are very professional. If you ask them to just sign their standard NDA that they normally use and send it back to you, usually, you know, 95% of the time that's good enough. Uh, you know, they're not your competitor. And so you can do that quickly without a lot of time and expense and delay. Then you can let them know who the party is. Um, occasionally in this process, you're also engaging other sorts of advisors, whether it's to prepare reports that might be helpful to potential bidders. Um, nice to get them, obviously, we want them to sign NDAs before you share information. And sometimes it's not the craziest thing for us, the law firm, to engage some of those outside advisors. Say it's someone who's going to touch on something like valuation. We'll say that the client is going to pay the fees, everybody agrees the work products being provided to us, we want it to the best of our ability protected by privilege. Um, so that's something just to think about. Another way, the attorney-client privilege is another great way to maintain an even higher level of confidentiality. Um, can you go to the next page, next slide? Now, the confidential information memo. So my typical experience, and I've been in the M&A market for decades, is that typically the investment bankers are coming together to help, um, help your client if they're the target prepare this. Um, if, you're, if your experience is like mine, you see the SIM for the first time the night before it's going to be distributed or after it's already been distributed, actually. That's the most common. I mean, most investment bankers, again, this is a very, you know, um, highly astute, you know, well-trained, um, high-end market uh, of individuals who are very careful. But I always urge people, don't overshare. There may be things, you, know, you don't have to have every single thing about your company and every secret thing you know or have or will have in the future or that provides value in your SIM. You know, you've got to have enough to interest people and be complete but not, not go crazy. Um, one experience I had in the last couple of months is we had a client going on the market. Of course, we got the SIM the night before it was going to be distributed. And at that point, everybody was in overdrive about the timetable. When we looked, they said, hey, can you look at the SIM and just, you know, we've got a number of competitors to just make sure, yeah, there are any antitrust issues. Oh, my God, there were totally antitrust issues. We corner the market, we dominate the market, we've got new acquisitions teed up, we can, you know, preserve our domination of the market. We're like, no, no, no. There are other ways to say that. There are other ways to demonstrate that you're a highly successful, significant player in the market without using, you know, I don't need my SIM to be exhibit A to an FTC complaint uh, or a Department of Justice complaint. So, you know, avoid statements that can be construed as anti-competitive. Um, and then limit your distribution. I mean, who are you going to share this with? You don't have to share it with every single individual at a bidder. You may be less concerned if it's purely a financial uh, party, a private equity, unless they've already got a platform in your industry, then they're really a competitor. Uh, maybe you want to number them. Maybe you want to password protect them. Do whatever you want to do. Do what you think is appropriate, but typically this is a very highly confidential 
uh, time during the process. So we just urge people to be a little bit more self-aware before the cat's out of the bag. Next slide. Um, again, some of these are gonna seem very practical. I mean, this is obvious, right? Prepare carefully in advance to populate a secure data site with due diligence. I've seen data sites that take months to be complete after you've already got indications of interest. That's not a good timetable. That's gonna make your timetable stretch out. Time is not your friend when it comes to confidentiality, as well as any other sort of a competitive threat. Not the least of which is, who knows when some disaster is going to happen? I mean, we've had the pandemic. I had a closing scheduled for 9-11. That didn't work out. So, you know, things can happen. So just spend the time doing a little bit of homework. And it's not because you're trying to be a jerk to people in the organization. It's because it really matters. Is, are these documents signed? Do they have the exhibits? Was there an amendment? Was there an extension? Now, populate the data site. And please, I beg you, I double beg you, do not use Dropbox. My firm doesn't view it as being secure, and many law firms do not view it as being secure. We have to get special one-time permission to be able to access it when our clients choose Dropbox. And by the way, I don't mean any disrespect to Dropbox, um, which is, a, I think, a low-cost, very um, well-known alternative. I would recommend that you use one of, you know, just go on the Internet and Google the top 10, top 20 uh, M&A data sites, Captera, data site, Digify, you know, Firmex, Ansarda. Go use one of those. Your investment banker will help you. You can weigh the cost. If you're the target, I urge you to try only to post your documents to a site that only you are the administrator of. When I have clients who populate a bitter site that they have no admin control over, I feel really, really nervous. Because if things don't go well, I don't know what's going to happen to that site. And make sure you know who the administrator is, who are the specific individuals. Um, if you are working with an investment banker, you're going to be able to get some help there. And then you can stage things. You can fully populate a data site, but only open certain folders. And you can open folders differently and at different levels to different bidders. Maybe you've got three key bidders. You're going to open more because you've already gotten an indication of interest. You like the bid range, it sounds good, you're gonna open another category of folders. Um, somebody else early on, you might say, listen, um, you know, we're gonna show you folders A, B, and C, let's look at the indication of interest, see if you're really in the ballpark, and then we'll decide if we're gonna give you more. So tightly managing this is really important. And then the other thing, obviously, and I've got this on a couple of slides because it's so important not to forget it, you can redact sensitive information. I never see a company list their full employee census with employee names. Make sure you've blocked out PII. Um, you don't have to show your customer names right up front. You don't have to show what your pricing metrics are. There are all sorts of things that you might be sensitive to, that your client might be sensitive to, so think about that. There are lots of ways to do this, you know, um, sort of electronically in terms of blocking. Um, it's not like the old days where you were there with like your heavy duty um, black magic marker hoping that it didn't like, you know, soak the paper and rip through all that kind of old school stuff. Lots of ways to do this, but it really takes a lot of time. And the problem in an M&A deal is that you have not brought everybody in your organization, your assistant, your, you know, your paralegal, this, they don't all know about this deal yet. So you may have trouble sometimes dealing with this, and that's where a lot of times the outside professionals help, especially your investment bankers. Um, I want to turn to the next slide and um, take a kind of, you know, stop talking for a couple seconds. And Robert, maybe you can just talk a little bit about the due diligence process and just uh, focus in a little bit on trade secret and restrictive covenant considerations while you're doing the due diligence. Uh, thanks, Susie. Yeah, I think this is a, a key area because I think the um, the acquiring company really needs to have a sense of the business that they that they're targeting, and what is it a manufacturing company or is it really more of a, a service level uh, company? Um, and is it the sales force? Is the sales force really driving um, the revenue? Um, or is it basically a software company and, and the, the real value in the company is the, is the software? And 
understanding what type of business it is is very important because then you're going to want to take a look at you know who if it is a um, is it a software company? You want to make sure you you know who owns the IP, and is it is it without doubt that the company owns the IP, and are there any uh, bodies buried with respect to ownership claims, either by employees or by uh, third parties, about who owns the software that is really driving the value in the acquisition? And um, you know, oftentimes uh, um, the companies can get blinded by the financials, and they're just the, the financials are driving the the transaction, but they don't give um, real consideration to what is this company really about, and what were to happen if some of the key employees were to leave. Uh, because they are upset by the transaction, or they think they can just take the customers and open up their shop on uh, open up a shop on the other side of the street. What is that going to do to the valuation? And that's where a consideration of the trade secret and the restrictive covenants, you know, really, um, you know, comes into play. And so you're, you're going to want to be looking at, you know, is this a, is this a company where there's significant customer turnover? Is this a company where there's significant employee turnover? Um, with respect to restrictive covenant and IP uh, trade secret lawsuits, uh, is this a company that's in litigation a lot on those issues? Is there a lot of turnover on those issues? Are they defending uh, bringing such cases? And then on the issue of the type of company that's really relying upon um, their employees, you know, to generate IP and to generate confidential trade secret information. How does the company, you know, protect that information? Do they have their house in order um, as it relates to um, the creation of IP? In other words, if it's a software company and they're relying upon their engineers and they have some high-profile engineers that are creating the software, um, do they have effective agreements in place? Do they have invention assignment in place? Or is the, you know, high-profile engineer claim that they have an ownership interest in the IP so that if you were to sell the company, you might have a headache with respect to ownership and that, that particular engineer might start their own company uh, and claim they actually have the ownership and uh, ownership interest. As part of the, um, you know, the due diligence considerations, you know, there's, um, but there's always the ask of, you know, I want to take a look at, you know, the the agreements that you have with your key employees. I want a sampling of your non-disclosure agreements with your employees. I want a sampling of your uh, non-compete agreements uh, with your employees. And you're taking an inventory of, um, you know, I have an understanding of who the key business leaders are in these various uh, business groups. And I have an understanding that they either are or not bound by uh, non-disclosure agreements or restrictive covenant agreements. That could be a key consideration as far as valuation, uh, particularly if you feel like the employee is a flight risk um, and is not otherwise bound by a restrictive covenant. Um, and this is also a consideration from the seller as far as seller hygiene before they go to market. Uh, making sure they have their house in order as far as that they, they do, they have rolled out, you know, restrictive covenant agreements with their employees. They do have invention assignment agreements with their employees. They have effective uh, policies and procedures um, in place. And, you know, all, uh, all hope is not lost, even if, you know, you're in the middle of the due diligence, so long as the seller has a plan um, you know, to either update um, their agreements or roll out new agreements, and that obviously could be a condition of the buyer um, in going forward with the transaction as far as making it a requirement that uh, agreements are executed with key employees and that gaps are filled with respect to the workforce. Um, another um, consideration is what is the likely um, um, impact on the employees once they know that a, a deal is going forward and what kind of impact is that going to have on the valuation and is there a, the expectation that it'll be business as usual uh, and that there'll be not much of a drop off of any in the business or that there actually will be an adverse reaction. Um, and these are all um, instances and examples of things that uh, both Susie and I have lived, um, you know, on doing various deals and things that have uh, deals that have resulted in litigation where th these types of considerations either were neglected or weren't fully uh, appreciated. Next slide, please. A great 
Um, thanks, Robert. Um, so one thing I just wanted to mention, I've, I had this come up um, three or four times this year where we developed a clean room. And a clean room and a clean room agreement is typically put in place, it's to protect against, you know, claims of anti-competitive behavior where particularly where you've got an interested bidder who's uh, a competitor or competitive threat, you um, take certain types of information, usually things relating to customers, pricing, um, competitively sensitive information, maybe certain business plans, and you only allow a limited number of people to see them. Usually they're, they're not gonna be people at the buyer who are in sales, pricing, marketing typically. You know, maybe you'll let the accountants look at it. Maybe you'll let the um, outside legal counsel look at it. And what you'll let them do is prepare a sanitized summary, which you as the uh, seller will then review in advance, sign off on and allow that to be provided. So you're letting somebody who's not gonna be a competitive threat, they're not a, a, a primary actor, get involved. And, and it's only around certain items. And usually those are, uh, a lot of times they're kept off the data site completely and they're handled kind of offline. But I did have that in a number of um, situations this year. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, you know, I think we probably really already covered this, you know, using coding systems, by the way, um, when you're masking, a lot of times instead of just blacking them out and having it be truly anonymous, a lot of times you're saying customer one, customer two, customer three, and you in fact, throughout the course of due diligence, talk about those customers with those designations. So are they coming up for renewal? Have you had discussions about renewal with customer one? You know, what markets is customer one in? I had a closing uh, about a month and a half ago where um, literally the buyer was a private equity backed competitor that was doing a roll up. Um, our client was uh, the most recent target in this roll up strategy and we did not release the names and unmask the names of the top 10 customers until um, 24 hours of closing. We got all of the documents done and negotiated. We gathered and exchanged signature pages and trust. Everything was compiled. I think it was on a Thursday. We were gonna close on the Friday. And then literally Friday morning, you know, 7.30, we released all the names of all the customers. Uh, I'm sure everybody screwed around a little bit. Probably, you know, may have surmised some of those. And then we um, had a quick closing call and release wire transfers and everybody felt fine. So that's not an unusual thing to do but you know, that's gonna be highly negotiated. Uh, why don't we go to the next slide? One thing I wanted to mention, um, during this entire time that you are bringing people um, at the seller, at the target, under the tent, um, something that we see increasingly is identifying that group of key executives, people who either you know, really need to be part of the process and are really critical uh, to the company post-closing you want to serve up value to the market. And so putting a retention bonus agreement in place that can be coupled with you stay for a period of time, you know, I typically see, you know, six months to two years, um, you've got to stay, maybe there's a vesting period that's in the retention agreement and then there's a bonus. I personally like to see some part of the bonus paid at closing because usually people are, you know, very stressed at that moment in time rather than waiting to do one big bullet at the end of a year or two years, that kind of loses the immediate sense of gratitude. Uh, but the nice thing is you can sell, so to speak, those retention bonuses to your bidders, indicating that you've got good comfort level and maybe you've even extended or cleaned up, uh, to Robert's point, uh, some of the restrictive covenants. Um, and then of course, confirm confidentiality. Um, let's run to the next slide. I think we've covered most of these items. Um, the one thing I just wanna mention in the first bullet, in your letter of intent, um, it is not unusual to indicate specifically who the bidder can communicate with. You can't just call anybody. Maybe we want you to contact all channel of communication is through the investment banker. Maybe it's one of two people who lead the target's deal team. Maybe it's outside counsel. 
it can be whatever you pick, but that's not an, that's not an unusual provision to put into your uh, LOI. And the other thing, either both in the LOI and potentially in the NDA, is when you have a bidder agreeing to keep everything confidential, an interested party, I mean, they're gonna wanna share it with their lawyers. They're gonna wanna share it with their accountants. Then they all of a sudden they say, oh, I wanna share it with my lenders. Well, who are, who's that? Well, then I wanna share it with my co-investors. Well, wait a minute, who are, who are they? So you've gotta make a decision. There's not a right or wrong way to do this. But in terms of confidentiality, get what you think you need and get it into these documents. So control who your bidders can share information. Do you just simply need them to be bound and your bidder takes responsibility? Or do you wanna get a counterpart signed by them? It's really up to you. And it may depend on how competitively significant the transaction is. It may depend on whether or not you're a public company. You may be, um, you know, maybe there's a higher level of sensitivity if there's trading of securities. Um, so just be aware of that. We can go to the next slide. Uh, here's one of my favorite topics that comes up all the time and everybody is 95% unprepared for it every single time. So you've got a client that's in a sale process. There are a couple of pieces of litigation, maybe some of it's garden variety, maybe some of it's a little bit more sensitive. And during due diligence, what does the, what does the bidder of counsel say to you? They say to you something that seems completely obvious, but you don't anticipate it. Well, we want to talk to litigation counsel. What? Uh, first of all, you haven't even told them the company's on the market. So all of a sudden, there's a scramble, and it's like, uh, um, okay, well, maybe yes, maybe no. Is it the right time? Is it sensitive? Um, I don't mind sharing public pleadings with anybody. Those are, those are a matter of public record. If we can serve them up and make it easy, great. So think a little bit in advance. Um, like in my next life, I'm gonna be more prepared for this on any particular deal. Um, you know, gee, maybe you should reach out and say, hey, confidentially in the next three to four weeks, we're gonna be having some due diligence. This is highly confidential. We're gonna ask you to um, speak with uh, some folks. We wanna protect our attorney-client privilege information. Um, I'd like to always limit the exchange of written content when I'm on the target side. I don't want a lot of emails and documents, and then just plan that. I had a transaction that closed in August that had a whole slew of legacy litigation um, coming out of like the, what I'll call the professional asbestos litigation industry, which is really epic. It's just all out there. They had never suffered a loss, they had never paid a dime, and they had three well funded insurance companies paying for everything. So what we did when we found out, we didn't, even, we didn't even know about this when the client went on the market, but we found out about it, we scrambled. We actually had one of our experienced lawyers do, an, do a review and prepare a brief report that was extremely useful and ultimately um, really got a couple of the bidders very, very comfortable uh, without having to do an exhaustive review of litigation being handled, you know, like by a guy in a remote state handling 36 lawsuits that's been out there for like 15 years. So um, something just to be aware of. We can go to the next slide. You know, I know we're just kind of uh, issue spotting in terms of the, you know, the sort of natural flow of the M&A deal. Um, HSR, Hart Scott Rodino, this is the pre-merger um, pre-merger notification uh, that you file if, if your size of parties and size of transaction is sufficiently high. Um, you, the filing is only really ready to go when both buyer and seller have filed. In theory, you don't wanna have inconsistent transaction descriptions, so you usually will trade those, and then you need to compare notes on how is your revenue divided by the NIICS codes versus theirs, other than that, it's my experience, you do not share your um, Hart Scott Rodino filings. I personally would not wanna do that. And then um, in the old days, pre-2000, I guess 21, it seems like it was like 10 years ago, I think it was maybe just the beginning of the year, or maybe even the end of last year, the FTC um, has put all of the early termination requests on pause. You can't get early termination anymore. In fact, word on the street is that they may get rid of it uh, permanently, which is really a pain in the neck. 
Um, but the, the one thing that used to be an issue, and if it comes back, it will be an issue again, is that if there is early termination of the waiting period, the 30-day waiting period after you file your filing, you can't close until it's expired. The downside of it is if it's granted, the party's names are published in the Federal Register, and the Federal Register is trolled by every M&A professional in the world to see what's going on out there. And so it's really a downside to requesting early termination. So sometimes you say, for confidentiality reasons, I just can't afford to do that. Of course, right now you can't do it because the FTC won't let you. Um, let's go to the next slide. Another issue kind of at this stage of an M&A deal, you know, you've, you've um, gotten well into the process, maybe you've made an HSR filing if it's required, and now you're starting to get closer and closer together with your counterparty who's going to buy you, I'm assuming I'm the target. And you start making business decisions together. Well, maybe we'll jointly approach this customer. Maybe we both do business with them. Maybe we'll talk about, you know, terminating, no. Bad, don't, don't do that, don't do that, very bad idea. It's called gun jumping. Um, you wanna talk to your antitrust counsel, make sure you don't prematurely share certain information and literally collaborate on decision making, particularly where you've got you know, some either actual or potential um, competitor issues, that's gonna be a problem, so we try to avoid that. So confidentiality, again, is your friend because now you're, um, it's harder to be accused of uh, jointly making decisions where you're not even sharing information. Now let's move to the next slide. Um, what we're going to do now for, I think, just the, you know, kind of the balance of the time that we have with you is um, talk a little bit about managing the definitive agreement. Um, and there are lots and lots of things in the definitive agreement that touch on these issues, confidentiality, who owns IP, restrictive covenants, all those sorts of things, releases. When I say releases, I really mean releases, especially in an equity transaction, releases by the sellers. They release the entity that's being sold from any claims. Your buyer wants a complete clean slate. Um, are there any disclosures that need to be made in connection with that? And then other closing conditions um, that are somehow um, related to confidentiality or restrictive covenants. Maybe key executives are not sellers, Literally, they don't have an ownership stake. Maybe you're gonna to have to get agreements entered into with those people as a condition of closing before your buyer will close. So um, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna turn, we can go to the next slide, I'm gonna turn things back to Robert just to talk a little bit about you know, the soft IP considerations, restrictive covenants, what do they protect, uh, how are they different in a sale transaction, um, and just talk about a couple of the unique um, legal issues that might vary on a state-by-state -state basis, and then we'll just wrap up with one or two uh, issues toward the end of a deal. So, Robert, why don't you take it away? Uh, thanks, Susie. So, you know, as part of the uh, definitive agreement, um, the both the buyer and the seller need to keep their sort of the eye on the prize about, you know, what what is the real focus of the deal? And, uh, you know, hopefully there's a mutual goal, you know, to transfer, you know, assets and business, uh, which, you know, includes the information, employees, and customer relationships. And, you know, it, it should go without a surprise that, you know, the purchaser expects the seller not to compete with it post-closing. Um, and that, that makes a lot of sense, particularly if it's in a sort of private transaction where the, uh, perhaps the, the seller is going away, the seller is going out of business. But it can be much more complicated where the uh, the seller uh, is is staying open. They may just be selling a segment of their their business, and that's where you can have um, additional sort of scrutiny on the uh, restrictive covenants and confidentiality. Uh, and that's something that the regulators are really uh, policing, uh, probably even more so going forward, um, where the seller is staying in business and really wanting to scrutinize. Uh, restrictive covenants related to solicitation of employees and uh, non-compete um, agreements. Um, it goes without saying that you know in a you know equity transaction, you know the idea is that you know you're, you're, you're the uh, the buyer is uh, purchasing what the seller is, is, is their business, and so um, I think the consideration there when it comes to the soft IP when you do the due diligence, make sure that the 
um, the seller actually owns what you what you deem to be very valuable of the of the company. Um, on the on the situation where you're, it's an asset uh, purchase. Make sure that 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 asset that 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 those important um, IP assets, those important contracts, are part of the schedules that are being transferred. Um, you know, um, the litigation arises where there's um, ambiguity or there's been mistakes with respect to not including some of those key items. It comes up in the restricted covenant perspective where there wasn't a um, an assignment of you know key contracts, including you know restrictive covenant type agreements. Um, and you know some other table setting is you know there, there's obviously from the seller's perspective that they want a continuity of the business. That in you know most cases they 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 want the transition of the employees in, in whole or part, and they want to um, obtain the confidential information uh, to keep the business um, you know going. So sort of business as usual, um, and that needs to be part of the definitive agreement, making sure that you're that they're, you're obtaining those rights, you're obtaining those that access, and you have a clear understanding of the employees that are going to be coming over. And the ones that you think might not be coming over, and whether that is um, that that impacts the transaction. Um, and I think one thing where it's a real customer-driven business, where you have sort of a top ten list of customer, top hundred you know, uh, customer list. I think it's important to understand what the expectation is with respect to uh, customer relationships, and whether or not um, there's risks in the the the, the customers uh, coming over. Uh, next slide, please. And so, in the de the definitive agreement, you know, typically, um, you know, there will be some sort of non compete uh, provision. Uh, there also may be customer non solicitation, uh, employee non solicitation. Um, typical things that you know to look out for is you know duration, making sure that it's uh, reasonable um, in duration. Um, you know, you know, rules of thumb. You know, and, and often, oftentimes it's a, a function of the particular uh, the state and the the the, the choice of law. Uh, that's been selected and the associated uh, forum selection clause, uh, but understanding the, under, the, the underlying state law as far as what's a, uh, an appropriate uh, duration of the non-solicit and non-compete. And then, you know, what's the scope? And, you know, oftentimes the, um, the buyer is really pushing for a really broad scope, but you have to understand that you can only really have a, a covenant that's protecting the business that you're acquiring. Um, and whatever that business was in, and whatever those employees and customers of that particular employee uh, or particular business was, so these very overly broad, um, you know, covenants, um, you're going to have enforceability considerations if there's ever a litigation, and you may even have uh, regulatory issues where you make it overly broad as to uh, business segments that the acquire, the you know, that that the selling company is not even in. And that's a particular concern, particularly where the seller is not going away and the seller is still uh, in business and has just sold off or spun off, um, you know, one of their related business. And so special consideration needs to be there to really scrutinize an understanding of what was, what was sold, uh, what employees uh, may be impacted, what customers may be impacted, and that the underlying definition of the business uh, comports with what, you know, what was really sold. Um, and you know, key considerations, and this can, this can very be very much be outcome determinative, is the choice of law and forum. You know, some jurisdictions are uh, much more uh, favorable and forgiving um, as it relates to restrictive covenants, um, and others are much more you know scrutinize those with uh, you know, and that can be often part of the underlying um, deal negotiations and can be very important in that regard. Um, obviously, you know, some must. To include our the ability to get injunctive relief, uh, sometimes you know liquidated damages are um, provisions are are common, and then tolling provisions those are significant because if there are if there is a a breach, you want to make sure that you get the benefit of your bargain. So that however long the um, um, the violating seller or the violating key employee has been violating the um, restrictive covenant, you want to make sure that you get the benefit of that bargain and the type, the period of time that they've been in violation is tacked on to the the, uh, the underlying duration of the covenant. 
Um, sometimes we've seen instances where there's real, real concerns about um, um, making sure that the, uh, the non-competes um, are abided by, um, by either the seller or some of the key employees. And we've seen instances where there may be holdbacks or, uh, um, or insurance um, type claims related to that. Um, that that you know, that's not as common, but it's things that we've seen. In, we've seen uh, particularly where there's concerns about you know competitive activity and breaches um, that that may occur. You know the typical uh, retort by the um, um, the buying company is that well, if you don't have a problem, you, you're going to obviously honor the covenant, so you shouldn't have a problem in um, you know you know honoring it. Um, but then the sellers, of course, they want to get their monies, and they don't want to have to deal with, you know, getting insurance or whatnot. Uh, next slide, please. Robert, and one thing I was going to say, you know, common situations that I see is, you know, say our client's the buyer, they want a 10-year worldwide, you can't compete with anything that they do. I'm like, no, like, that's a terrible approach. Make it a reasonable number of years, make it the markets that you're in, and you've got to limit it to the business that you're buying. If you want to get protection, for the business going forward, you need to get that under a, uh, an employment agreement or some other sort of a consulting agreement. So I think a lot of times parties don't realize they're shooting themselves in the foot if they don't try to temper and be a little bit more realistic, because we want these to be enforceable, uh, and that's, that's really a common issue. You go to the next slide. Yeah, that's that's right, Susie. And I think that in practice, you know, what I've learned is it's very important for the in-house counsel that are driving the deal to to spend some extra time on the non-compete and make sure that the non-compete is really tailored to the transaction, and make sure that it's not just some form that their corporate counsel used, but that you know if they started off with a form, that's fine, but that it's actually tailored to what the the, um, the parties are expecting to get out of the deal. Um, and that it, it's the right size fit for the deal, and you know, special attention should be given to that, and not just relying upon uh, forms, um, but actually tailoring the the, the, the covenant. Um, you know, the good thing on in the definitive agreement, the good thing about um, restricted covenants and non and non competes um, specifically, is that unlike employee um, non competes. Um, there's more, the courts are more forgiving as it relates to um, enforcing those, um, those covenants. And typically, you know, the legitimate business interests um, that are present um, to justify the non-compete in the, uh, the, the buy-sell context are the, you know, the, the, the transfer of goodwill, uh, the transfer of confidential information and trade secrets. So whereas, you know, state courts often scrutinize uh, employee non-compete um, so long as the covenant is reasonable in scope um, and duration and geographic, um, you, know, uh, to, you know, sometimes de geographic uh, scope, depending upon the business, um, you know, the courts um, are willing typically to enforce those. Um, and there, there are many jurisdictions, depending upon the state law, are willing to blue pencil or reform um, overly broad covenants. But that's not a license to shoot for the moon, honestly. I, I, I stick by what you know, Susan and I have said as far as really try to customize the covenant for the right side, um, what's reasonable under the circumstances. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and, you know, I just wanted to highlight that, you know, even in jurisdictions that are notorious for being, you know, very um, dismissive of non-competes, that even in, you know, California, uh, they do allow uh, non-competes in the sale of a business. And, you know, there's even um, case law where they've uh, upheld a preliminary injunction prohibiting comp uh, competition anywhere within the United States following the sale of a business. That doesn't mean that you should include a nationwide restriction if your selling company, you know, only does business in a handful of states. But that just goes to show you that, you know, there is there will actually be peace for your your non-competing any even in those jurisdictions that are notoriously tough on restrictive covenants. Next slide, please. Um, and this particular uh, slide is focused on, um, apart from the you know, restrictive covenant analysis, is uh, focused on the, you know, the transfer of trade secrets um, and making sure that as part of the, uh, the underlying transaction, if, you know, the, if the lifeblood or the, you know, if there is significant value emanating from the company's, that the acquired company's uh, trade secrets, 
that you know that that as the buyer you have a you have a, an understanding of what their core trade secrets are, um, particularly if that's you know the real value that's coming from the company. Um, and you're seeing more of that where some you know technology companies are relying less upon um, patents and more upon um, trade secrets. And so you know it's it, it's important as far as that calculus and maybe you've you, maybe you've um, hired. Um, some consultants and experts to really understand some of the IP issues about, um, you know, what it is you're exactly uh, buying, but you should make sure that you, you, you build that in to your definitive agreement. So if there, if you do know that there is some sort of dispute by a joint venture partner or by some vendor or software employee um, that you try to build that in to your transfer uh, in the definitive agreement. Um, and it's also part of the due diligence that we talked about is that making sure that others don't have valid claim to the core trade secrets. Um, and, you know, it's also as part of the, um, the due diligence process and, and also in the definitive agreement and some of the tertiary agreements that you're going to have on um, the ancillary agreements is that um, you want to make sure that, you know, the company that you're acquiring has uh, agreements that are, um, you know, compliant with applicable law. And so one easy fix is making sure that they have um, non-disclosure agreements and non-disclosure agreements that comply with the federal uh, uh, Defend Trade Secrets um, Act. And we have a specific slide that talks about the, the special language to include in those non-disclosure non agreements. Um, but that's one thing that, the, that, that that's an easy sort of fix. Um, and then, as part of the um, um, the transaction, is the, you know monitoring a key departure before or after the sale transaction uh, to make sure that the core trade secrets have not been compromised. So, if it's that instance of a uh, a high flying sales rep or a high flying software engineer, um, that if you had concerns. And you had concerns that they may be a flight risk, that they may, you know, compromise your your IP, compromise the bill, the, you know, the business case. That you make sure that the trade secrets don't go um, out the door um, before the transaction or closely, you know, thereafter. Um, next slide. Yeah. So, um, Robert, you know, one thing for everybody who's, you know, active in M&A, you know, like the bane of your existence, obviously, is, you know, those darn disclosure schedules. You know, it's the listing of information relevant to the representations and warranties that are made in the definitive agreement. Um, it, it's really amassing a all of that. The amount of data and value in the schedules is huge. You know, frankly, the agreement almost looks generic compared to the action and the disclosure schedules. Very often, um, uh, a party will put, you know, their more junior and maybe sometimes more inexperienced people to cover the disclosure schedules, which just get updated repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. But, uh, you know, make sure you avoid inadvertent disclosure. If all of your customer names have been redacted in the data room, don't list the customer names on the disclosure schedule prematurely. What I like to do to try to avoid that is sometimes you'll take your single document of disclosure schedules, but you know, one in the middle that relates to, to customer contracts, maybe we say see exhibit A, see exhibit B, and at least try to have some practical tips to control things, because I've seen a lot of um, inadvertent disclosure. Um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, where I want to just um, talk a little bit about ancillaries. Um, the other thing that I want to mention to you is that you are eligible for CLE credit um, for this webinar, and I have a CLE code that I am going to read to you. It is SS2736. So that's S as in Sam, S as in Sam, 2736. And there'll be some forms after this that you'll be able to um, go ahead and apply for an hour of CLE credit. Um, just quickly, and, and um, Robert, I'll turn things back over to Robert to wrap up for a couple of minutes here. Um, lots of other documents in connection with an M&A deal outside of the definitive agreement. I mean, there may be executive employment agreements for key employees, assignments could be separate restrictive covenant agreements. Sometimes there's stakeholders who aren't a party to the definitive agreement. 
Um, there may be issues when it comes to protection and capturing some of the you know, soft IP assets. You're going to have to be thinking about if it's a stock versus an asset deal, what do I need to get? Do I get an assignment? Do I get a change of control consent? Um, many times, uh, change of control consents or even assignments, frankly, are gotten after closing. So I think you want to be careful um, as to what kind of risks associated with that. And then, you know, just assignability generally, being careful. Uh, but Robert, let me go ahead and turn it over to you. I, I think there, the last couple of slides have some of the technical points you wanted to just, um, I think, confirm relative to, you know, DTSA and employment agreements. Next slide. Yeah, and I think, yeah, yeah, and I think from a big picture perspective, um, the, the agreements that were listed on the previous slide, those are some of the agreements that are typically uh, considered and um, are typically made part of, um, you know, requirements uh, under the definitive agreement that these types of agreements, you know, may be, uh, be entered into. Um, we did get a question, and the question is from a due diligence standpoint, what is the best way to contact consultants and contractors and assess whether they have any claims to trade secrets? I think the way of addressing that is as part of the due diligence is having an understanding of, you know, what, are, what is the key IP here? and um, get representations from the, the seller about, you know, you know is, is there a patent involved? Is there, if it's a trade secret type thing, uh, get an understanding that the company's position is that it's owned by the company and have a review of the invention assignment agreement, make sure that they comply with, um, you know, applicable law. If there's an opportunity to interview any employees as part of the transaction, that may be an indication where you could find out if there's any uh, dispute uh, obviously, a search of uh, media and whatnot, that would might be another thing. And then finally, try to protect yourself, you know, with reps and warranties that the company actually owns what they, you know, that, that, they, that they claim belongs to them. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, so as part of these ancillary closing documents, typically, you know, there'll be, you know, there, there may be um, retention agreements, there may be um, um, executive employment agreements. Um, on this particular slide, I'm highlighting um, one of the things that you should include as part of your non-disclosure provision in your employee agreement um, under the Federal Trade Secrets Act. Um, there's a whistleblower immunity um, provision that should be included in your employment agreement. And you say, well, why should I include that? Well, this provides you the ability to get attorney's fees if there's a breach of um, um, a breach of trade secrets, uh, if your trade secrets are misappropriated. It also provides you the ability to get um, it also provides you the ability to get um, exemplary damages. And you say, well, is it really required? I think the, the best practice is that you include it. Uh, certainly, um, companies that have faced uh, whistleblower type claims, uh, some you know, plaintiffs in those cases have said, well, you had an old agreement and you didn't comply with the Defend Trade Secrets Act, and you're actually trying to stifle my ability to report you know, whistleblowing activities. And so when you do your review as part of due diligence, um, taking a sampling of the agreements that the selling company has with their employees, this is an easy add to make sure that they have the up-to-date language that complies with the uh, DTSA. Next slide, please. Another real important issue that comes up in, um, in deals involving uh, you know, restrictive covenants with employees is if it's in, in the context, is this a merger? Is this an asset deal? And um, what particular uh, state law is going to govern whether or not the employee's um, non-compete restrictive covenant agreement is assignable by the, you know, assignable to the acquiring company? Um, you know, typically it's not necessarily going to be an issue in a merger. It can be, and it really depends upon the state in which uh, the non-compete is governed by. Um, but it becomes more of an issue where, where it's assigned. And uh, as you can see, some particular jurisdictions allow automatic assignment without an assignment provision, but some jurisdictions require that the underlying non-compete agreement with you, that, that the seller has with the employee actually specifies that it's, um, that, that, that it's um, it, that transferable to successors and interest. And there's some states out there that have not let, um, addressed the question. So, um, you know, 
it's important to have the assignment, making sure that the assignment provision is in the employee non-compete. If it's not, and, and as part of your due diligence, that you discover that you know this this non-compete may not be um, enforceable by the acquiring company. That's something that you know may need to be taken into account into valuation. That may be to be taken into account in coming up with a solution to fix that you know the particular um, issue. Um, from the employee's perspective, they 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 view it. They can view it as a personal services contract, and they you know they hitch their wagon to a particular company. But if they were to be you know acquired, they they may think that it's not um, certainly that that they wouldn't be bound by it, and that you know in the absence of an assignment provision, um, depending upon the jurisdiction, they may they may be right. Um, next slide, please. And this kind of uh, lays out, you know, how to do the analysis when assessing whether the uh, employment agreement, the restrictive covenant agreement is uh, assignable. Uh, you need to take a look at whether there's a choice of law provision and then lays out different scenarios uh, depending upon what you determine, you know, whether or not there's an assignment provision, what the choice of law is, what this jurisdiction, um, you know, requires as far as assignment provisions. Do they allow them? Do they not allow them? Uh, do you need to have the employee sign new agreements? Um, you may need to provide, you know, present an authorization for the employee to consent to the assignment as part of the asset transfer. Um, you may need to, you may need to require the buyer to enter into uh, non-competes with retained employees. Um, these are all part of the calculus depending upon um, the jurisdiction in which the employee, um, you know, works. Next, uh, next slide, please. One uh, one thing that we wanted to highlight, and it comes up occasionally in these deals, is when, um, you know, particularly in closely held companies, where the um, not only is the seller, you know, selling their interest, but the seller is staying on as um, as an employee. And you know, do you include a non compete in those situations, and what does that non compete look like? Uh, typically, what you'll see is the non compete. Um, you know, will have a set duration tied to the closing. Um, but it will also indicate that the uh, the non-compete, you know, will stay in place so long as the employee um, is employed by the company, uh, you know, plus a, a, a reasonable uh, tail. Um, and, you know, oftentimes, you know, there's an end strategy. Um, and so the employee, you know, typically would only stay, you know, you know, something around three to five years. And it really doesn't become an issue. Uh, but it can become an issue where the employee stays on longer you know, say 10 years after the deal, and then the employee comes back and says, you know, this is not, um, this is not reasonable. The you know, deal was 10 years ago. You would never be able to get a non-compete with an employee for 10 years. And then the company comes back and says, well, you know, we didn't really get the benefit of our bargain because you were an employee, you got compensation. So that even though you sold your interest, we never really got the value of those years. Um, and you know the cases go both ways, so it's really a function of knowing the particular jurisdiction and the choice of law to to, to advise as far as how long to go um, as far as that non-compete goes. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so we're uh, going to grab. Minutes, uh, Susie, close uh, close with us. Yeah, thank, thanks, Robert. Yeah, we're going to close with this. I appreciate that we're going a couple minutes over. Um, so you would think this wouldn't be controversial to announce or not to announce, but managing publicity. Um, I had a client bought by a public company earlier this year for a very substantial sum. And believe it or not, this was a large global public company. They weren't required to do um, a press release. It wasn't deemed to be material. I was really stunned by it. And in fact, they viewed the complete absence of publicity to be beneficial to them. So um, really try to deal with this in the definitive agreement and, you know, determine are there obligations to do it or not do it, um, what are the requirements. But, you know, just because you have a large deal, that does not necessarily mean uh, that the parties will want to disclose it or that it will be material relative to the acquiring party, um, especially a large global public company. So this is virtually always addressed in the definitive agreement, and I would encourage you to do that. Um, we thank you very much for joining us. Um, I do know that there are a couple of questions. I think what we will do is probably just follow up by um, email afterwards, um, just very, very briefly, you know, the attorney-client privilege, 
I mean, your client owns the ability to waive it, so it's pretty uh, globally enforceable unless your client agrees to let it go. Rep and warranty insurance, you will have entered into a very strict uh, confidentiality agreement with the carrier. Confidentiality is going to be their stock and trade. Uh, and then I know also that Robert will be able to provide a list of the states that have and have not approved the automatic assignability of employee agreements. So we'll do a little bit more follow-up. But thank you again for joining us, and um, we look forward to your participation in our future webinars. Thank you.